Welcome to Season 2, Episode 39 of Comic Book Nation, the official podcast of comicbook.com. I'm your host, Kofi Outlaw, and with me today, I have the regular crew, Matt Aguilar. What up? Janelle Wheeler. Hey, guys. And one of the original members of this team, Mr. Brandon Davis is back with us. Hey. Uh, Nothing much. We're still knee deep in our quarantine slash social revolution arc of the show. And uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Today's like a nice healthy smattering of things that we got to kind of address. So I thought we'd have a nice varied team of experts with us today. We got our first trailer for the long awaited uh, Bill and Ted threequel. We're going to talk about a major upset in the comic industry right now. We also got to get back to another rumor about the Batman the, and its unfolding universe. We talked about Bane last time, and now it's time to, to get into another villain rumor. Plus, we learn more about the new Evil Dead that's coming our way, and we have a whole deep dive in a bunch of geeky goodness, which includes uh, our first check-in about our la- Avatar, The Last Airbender, watching a recap of NXT in your house, plus a bunch of stuff Matt likes to talk about, like gaming and comics and all that stuff. You know, we, gotta, we always got to cater to you, buddy. Plus, we're going to review Netflix's The Last Days of American Crime. Tell you if that's worth a watch. So uh, stay tuned for all of that. All right, starting right at the top, let's talk about Bill and Ted Face the Music. At a time when we all probably need to uh, think about being excellent to each other, Bill and Ted have returned. This long-awaited threequel is, uh, we knew, I mean, it's been something we were highly anticipating back in the old world pre-2020. Um, you might have forgotten about it, you know, with other concerns this year, but Bill and Ted is still coming our way and apparently still coming our way this year, which is, you know, good news for if we're trying to end out the year, maybe getting back to some good in some particularly feel good movies. And so we got the first trailer, Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter are back as Bill and Ted. And the premise is these guys were kind of the whole arc of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure and bogus journey was they were trying to write this song that would like unite the world. Um, and now it's kind of, it's all these years later, almost in real time, and they haven't accomplished it yet as musicians. And now it's like the deadline. They have to create this song because the future depends on it if they don't do it in like eight hours or something like that. And so it becomes a time travel scheme where they want to go to the future where they've already saved the world and learn how to make the song and then go back in time so they can save the world. And of course, that kind of harebrained time travel hijink is going to go uh, pretty wrong. So... What did you guys think? Because uh, I think the last one of these kind of nostalgic, long-awaited sequels, as we call them now, uh, was Ghostbusters Afterlife, which kind of, it got a little testy around here. We were a little split on Ghostbusters Afterlife. So what did you guys think of Bill and Ted Face the Music? Uh, Personally, I, I, it was refreshing. It was really great to uh, be excited about something um, that wasn't really heavy. Uh, I felt like, buying into these guys as adults and being like airheaded and stuff like that i was a little nervous about it but just from the trailer alone i was still kind of like okay yeah like they just grew up a little bit but they're still at the core of the same guys that they always have been they kind of grew up a lot of bit if you look at them yeah looks wise for sure (laughs) but they look great though i mean I don't know. I'm pumped about it. I think it's, I, I'm really excited to have something. I watched uh, this movie, the, the first movie um, in quarantine because I needed some lighthearted, feel good uh, movie time. And I had a blast revisiting it. So I think I will love this movie as well for what it is. Don't try to make it more than what it is. It's a fun, cheeky, like experience it's it's not like a serious film with a brilliant acting and special effects it's just gonna be a fun movie i mean bd broke the ice on this so i guess i'm gonna get into it i was gonna try to save this dark part for the end but um yeah these long-awaited sequels are freaking me out with bringing back old people for like actors from my youth now that are just like visibly older (laughs) kind of freaking me out it's like making me question my own mortality um, we all know Keanu Reeves preserves, but uh, like Alex Winter definitely looks like, you know, he's aged a bit. So there is that. It, it's like a new uncanny valley, except for older people instead of CGI people. But um, all of that said, it, it was good. It, it was a little weird at first to see them try to get back into the shtick of Bill and Ted because it, it just looked like they had come out to do like present an award at the MTV Movie Awards or something. <laughs> But like after a while, I actually did get into it. 
I, I wish the trailer had kind of focused a little bit more. Again, like my problem with these first trailers for kind of both these movies is trying to just hook us with the nostalgia factor. Whereas I'm kind of more of a person who wants to see kind of more of the new stuff and like what's the new attraction to this. And so I would have liked to see more from the daughters who were played by like two excellent actresses and like their interactions with their daughters, which kind of, I think will be a real funny hook of the movie. Um, but the time travel piece is going to be kind of funny and them being able to use the elevator and do that all again. That did actually give me kind of like feels like the same way I, when I always see Marty McFly and they kind of burning tire treads and stuff like that. Like I saw seeing them get back in the elevator and travel through time was kind of cool. Reconnect with death, you know, William Slatter, uh, what's his name? William Slattery and like all that. So I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm kind of coming around to this. It was a little bit jarring at first, but uh, I'm, I'm coming around to it. Yeah, I kind of agree with Kofi on this. I, I I was kind of the same thing. I at first, the first half of that trailer, I was still like, I don't know how I feel about this. This seems kind of dumb. Like I I was not I was not in. By the end of it, I was especially like when they get to the uh, prison or whatever, and like they see the two future versions. Like that sheer like ridiculousness level kind of sold me, and I went okay. Like this is I know what I'm in for. This is kind of fun that they're. It's still weird to see them like using like those sounding that way because I don't know they t- it's it's a hard disconnect for like they haven't really changed at all like almost at all like there's no visible line of like it's been a long time so I don't know it was hard for me to like to get over that because I still kept seeing like man you, there's literally no change and it feels weird that there's no change but it's fun. It's ridiculous, and you know, I, I, it won me over by the end. That's kind of. I, I agree with Matt totally. I think it was kind of jarring to see them like they obviously there is like if we're not addressing the fact that they age so much, like it's hard to just ignore it, like because they're acting the same, they're saying words the same, like excellent, all that stuff, like, and they're playing the same airheaded characters who didn't grow up mentally but physically they grew up. I felt like oh, this might be kind of dumb, but then again, like. We can just have fun with a movie. We don't need to go into the movies and expect this to be like Inception or the next Christopher Nolan flick. This is Bill and Ted. Like, it's going to be fun. It looks like a fun movie. Just leave your logic at the door. It's a stupid time travel movie intended to be a lighthearted romp. Like, let's, in that regard, I, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Will it be like a very good movie? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's going to be what it's going to be. I'll watch it for sure. Yeah, I was going to say, BD, I mean, you better get your game face on. You could be, this could be one of your first junkets back out talking to these guys through plexiglass before you know it. Dude, well, I don't know if junkets are ever coming back at this point. Oh. Yeah, I'm, oh, stop. Get too real over here. The last junket I went to, <laughs> before everything really seemed like it was going bad, they had signs outside the door that said, please no shaking hands and no selfies. Now it's going to be like, please don't come within 100 feet of the talent, but you can all be herded in the corner because we care about With your masks on. Yeah. Else. yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. So we'll see. But all right, let's Bill and Ted face the music. I mean, there's not too much to get into. It's a Bill and Ted movie. Like you said, it, it, it kind of is what it is. Let's get to something that has a little bit more meat on it, which is that uh, DC Comics shocked the world last week when they basically said, they are not kind of re-upping their relationship with uh, Diamond, which is, you know, Matt, explain this, because I don't want to mess this up and have a bunch of comic stands coming for me. <laughs> okay. Like, I really don't. Uh, I'm wondering so, if this does anything with digital. Like, I'm curious about that, too. So for, so for those um, who don't know, in the comic industry, it's pretty much Diamond is the main distribution. That's the way that comics get to comic stores and the direct market and all that. So your local comic shop orders them through Diamond. And, and there's been, a, for years and years and years, Diamond has had a monopoly. It's essentially the only real big time game in town. And because of that, when Diamond, you know, uh, has a history too of like sh- shipping things late sometimes or things get damaged or there's things with like issues with returns. So like if you talk to comic book retailers, they all have their own horror stories or whatever of dealing with diamond and you can't really go anywhere else. So it's always been this like weird thing and and they have this lockdown, but because of 
you know, the pandemic and their decision to stop shipping any titles, even stuff they'd already had in house, they weren't going to ship it to stores and they, and they put a halt to it. Most just decided to not ship. They were just going to wait until Diamond decided to resume. So boom, Marvel, all the, all the other companies, right? Image decided. DC did that for like briefly, but then they essentially went like, you know, this is something we've, it's always been thought about like if companies would just go around and like either start their own or go through somebody else and just kind of help them become a bigger force in the industry. DC essentially just went and did that and working with two other major um, comic book uh, stores, they're actually uh, retailers, the companies that own them are who are kind of joining forces and distributing single issues to the market. They were also going to go through um, Penguin Random House for like graphic novels and things like that. So they set all this up during the pandemic and that's why DC books have been, some have been getting to stores while some of the other ones took a lot longer to get to stores. And now DC is saying like, we're gonna keep doing that. Like we're not gonna go back to just exclusively going through you anymore. We're gonna do this through our new network and you know, kind of, see what happens like this is it's it's very much not the norm this is and it, the fact that it's one of the big two doing it that's really the only companies it could be to kind of set this kind of precedent um you know i don't see marvel moving or doing that anytime soon but uh it is a interesting it's been received kind of mixed because like some retailers you know, aren't keen on the fact that they now have to go through several companies or they have to set up different things. They, at least before it was kind of the, it was kind of the evil they knew. They could go through one place and they knew that's where they got their books from. And now that's going to change a bit. Some are great. Some are excited about the idea because it opens up competition and maybe, you know, makes Diamond change some things to kind of make sure other places don't follow. So it's it's really interesting on the digital front it doesn't really change anything um mostly because every company honestly has such a different model for digital it's still kind of the wild wild west like dc and marvel have of course like the most locked down methods for like releasing digital content whether it's uh some i uh, believe are like there's a delay in when they release things um to like their unlimited programs and things like that some are day and date it just kind of depends on the publisher. Um, but as far as physical copies, it's a, it's a big deal and it's a big change, but it will kind of be months from now, maybe even a year before we can really see like what, how this affects the industry. So it's kind of the stitch. So overall, good or bad for like small comic book stores, like shops that are local and kind of mom and pop and kind of like the lifeblood of this. It's industry. hard to say because it, because it is so split right now. Like some stores are all for it because okay. they've had severe issues with Diamond in the past. Got it. Some are wary because it, you know, it's also too has to deal with like stores, like comic stores have a very small profit margin and they, and they have to be very like, uh, strategic about the books they order you know if, if they know they can sell five they will probably only order six like they'll just keep that one extra issue on hand in case someone walks in that's why you don't walk into a lot of stores and find a bunch of back issues on the wall you'll see a bunch of back issues kind of in the thing where they collected over the years and they're a little yeah you know, they don't do that since the 90s man yeah like they yeah. they can't because the profit margins are so thin yeah. i mean the book and they have went to stay up on so, it. so skyrocketed in price too like yeah I remember when i started collecting in the 90s it was 99 cents for a book yeah like, which was crazy um but yeah it's the same kind of like i'm sitting here like listening to you but i was also if you saw me looking down i'm like on the phone trying to connect my little brother who works helping um with kind of restaurant direct delivery service uh and he's he like kind of specializes in helping people go around these grub hubs and postmates that are like ruining restaurants because they take such huge margins of the profit for for kind of helping kind of get yeah. the food to distribute it and it's like you're just like cracking up because you're like telling this story about like what's happening in the industry and i'm like literally trying to help somebody else in this other industry because this is, <laughs> yeah this is what's happening now during this whole lockdown like it, it became so important that people you know kind of how you distribute di distribution lanes to people now and getting stuff to people 
And yeah, why are you, people are really questioning, like why pay these third party people? Like when you had other profit margins and in, in ways of making your profits, like it didn't, people didn't really examine it too closely. It was just there, it was established. You're like, whatever, it's there. Um, now when it's like so crucial and the money is so crucial, like, yeah, people are really taking a hard look at this and being like, do we need these middlemen? Nah, I'm not sure. Well, in DC also, I feel like, and this is probably the same for most publishers, but like they didn't, I'm sure they didn't like being beholden to one company. Like essentially Diamond oh, shutting down. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Diamond shutting down essentially went, okay, you're not getting any revenue from that, from whenever we just decide to open up shop. And, you know, that having that giant chunk of revenue tied to just the whims of one company yeah, like, especially if you're a conglomerate, like, you know, and with Marvel, the same way with Disney, right? Like, they're not, they don't want this one company just, like, shutting on or off the valve. They they want a hand in, or at least an alternative to go, we can get around that, and, you know, whatever they do, they'll do. So, yeah, it, it's, I think, it, ultimately, it's better for the industry long term. I, I imagine a lot of comic book stores are, are already having financial issues, and they're strapped for cash, so I don't know how this helps them or not in kind of the small term. Um, but I think long term, it's better for the industry. All right. So that's Diamond. We're going to move on from that. Uh, let us know your thoughts. You guys are comic collectors. Hit us up at hashtag comic book nation. Let us know what you think about this. If you want better distribute or just, I don't say better. I'm not trying to have a dog in this fight. But if you want the comic book industry to kind of change how they distribute things and how you can get things, let us know. We're going to hop on over to the Batman. So last time we were talking about Warner Brothers possibly putting Bane in the Batman sequel and kind of having scrapped a Bane solo movie possibly for that. This week, uh, I think it was Mr. Brandon Davis hit up a, a rumor that, which is not so surprising, but I wanted to kind of dip into this, which is that the Batman sequels could also follow the Dark Knight trilogy pattern by using kind of hinting at Joker in the first film before introducing him properly in the second. And the rumor is that we would see Joker in a second and third installment of this, the Batman trilogy under Matt Reeves um, with him kind of playing a, a role among other villains in these movies. So what do you guys think? Do you think we should have a Joker in these Batman sequels? Do you want him earlier? Do you want to just take a break from Joker for a while? What do you guys think? Do you guys have anybody who could play him? Jay, like, I'm sorry, Janelle, Jerry Leto's off the table. I don't even have to suggest that. Uh, anybody else? Oh. I, I, don't I, I love the idea. I think this Batman trilogy feels like it's going to, it has the opportunity to be like the most complete Batman universe live action story that we will have seen. Like, I mean, the Dark Knight is a complete trilogy, but it doesn't, dive into everything batman and when it does i mean bane in the movies in the dark knight rises is really cool tom hardy did a great job but that's not bane you know what i mean like that's not the bane we know what i want to see you saying? <laughs> i was waiting for someone to do the impression <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I only do the joker laugh <laughs> but i think that i think it's i think it's kind of inevitable to bring joker into this trilogy with what we're doing i think this really has a chance to be a complete Batman universe. I'm almost like sad that it, it that feels like it's not going to be connected to the larger DC universe because it seems like we're really building a world, a Gotham world in Matt I kind of like that though. And I mean, I like it to an extent, but I, I also want to see this Batman become fully realized. And then I'd like to see him interact with Superman and the Flash and Wonder Woman, whether that means... Oh no, we've hit a landmine because I'm the total opposite. Like, Bro! I actually want... I want DC, see what they've done so far is I think we've keep balancing between these two poles where you have people who like Nolan who are just like, I want to do my own standalone Batman thing, my own version of Batman. And then you have Batman like connected to a much larger universe or things like that. Or you had the nineties, like before we had these whole kind of blockbuster franchises in the nineties, you just had Batman movies that just had numbers on them and they were just kind of anthologies really. Like they were just one story was kind of maybe connected to the next, but not really. Um, and they were just kind of each individual standalone stories. I would love to see what they did on the animated front, which is just like an entire corner, which is just an entire Batman world 
that's interconnected in in and of its Batman-ness, right? Like, but just the Batman stuff. So just like an entire Gotham world, just an entire, you know, the whole shebang bang with Gotham City Sirens and Birds of Prey and Batman. And if we want to get into things like Nightwing and Red Hood and Joker and all that stuff and have it be in its own kind of universe that doesn't have to worry about like the DCEU stuff and all that. And I want another Batman in the DCEU. Like DC has made it apparent that like clear they could do all these things. So like, I, I mean, this one just feels like it's shaping up to be the most complete, like you said, as we're going to get not just a Batman franchise, but an entire, like a Gotham that feels like an entire Gotham and a whole underworld and all the rogues are there together. They don't just pop up and die in like <laughs> origin stories per film. Like, you know, this is a whole world. And I would love for it to just be its isolated thing. And I don't ever need to see like a Superman come flying into it. Like, you know, I'm good on that. I don't need that. And I don't want to see it be necessarily the DCEU, but I would like to see a fully realized, like a like starting with a really good starting point, Justice League. I mean, we got Zack Snyder's version, which was a studio intervention disaster uh, and whatever else uh, we don't there's no look way at I'm, that wordplay acrobatics way to keep those release the snyder cuts happy look well, at it i mean what, you're what you, a professional what, man whatever you want whoever you want to blame the first three movies no, you had it right uh, with studio intervention Man of Steel yeah, like, was a great movie i remember some theatrical cut was not justice league theatrical cut i had fun watching it because i like seeing the heroes interact it's not a good movie will zach snyder's justice league be good who the f- knows i don't know but my point is, we're going to have an awesome, fully realized Gotham. I think it would be really cool to, ha- to have it operate adjacent to a fully realized Metropolis, a fully realized Central City, and have just more characters that you can access. Have the Birds of Prey out there. And we can't get too complicated in building that because we just had a Birds of Prey movie. I would love to see Ben Affleck play Batman in the DCEU and Robert Pattinson play Batman in a separate universe that's isolated and becomes fully and only Batman, but I think it best case scenario, I'd rather see the Batman start another universe where everybody can be there and Batman is not limited to only his characters, but focused on his characters the same way Iron Man was focused on his characters in Iron Man movies for the most part and then became part of Avengers movies. It's a similar thing. It'd be cool if they did a whole just isolated Batman universe and when they get done with this franchise, they end it with just like a time jump and you just see Pattinson stand in front of Mirren and evolves and it's like Ben Affleck. Stop. And like, oh, <laughs> they just bring it all back around. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Oh geez. Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of, I think I, at this point, I think I side with Kofi on the fact that like, I'm okay with them just doing this little pocket of Gotham, flesh it out as much as you want and make it super cool. There's enough richness to Batman's world and enough characters to to change things up you don't really need the rest of the dc universe to oh, you make totally that don't interesting. need it i yeah. just the 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 nerd and fan in me would just love to see this fully realized world at the quality i think matt reeves is going to make it but i just we have to get over the fact that like there's this is not marvel this is not the mcu and it hasn't been for a minute so like i've let go the whole thing of like interconnecting them and having them in the same playground i let that like go because i just don't see that happening without a massive either one whole movie to just fix it all and essentially make a crisis on screen or overhaul yeah or but again that brings its own things okay that's not exactly easy to do and And if you love certain castings now you're kind of like loyal to them like i love just a wonder woman yeah man i don't know i'm kind of with brandon on this personally because i i also want to just like geek out and nerd out and for me like you guys already know i say this all the time more content more content just give me more of everything but to bring it full circle on the whole joker uh i don't know why and i am crazy about the joker the joker is my favorite villain of all time ever uh before any like i was i was rocking like the joker since i was a kid i love the joker but i don't know why they're bringing the joker again because there's just we don't need the joker to like batman like we need to like batman for batman like i just feel like it's kind of like this go-to that people like oh Absolutely. let's throw the joker in it and it will be good and i just special like focus on other villains focus on batman 
let Joker, I mean, Joker has had its moment and then maybe bring him back like further down the line, like what, you know, you guys were saying, but I, for the first movie, please no. And Just, I can agree with what you're saying too. I mean, that you can look at the Spider-Man movies for that. Like we didn't get, everybody wants to see Doc Ock again or yeah. Sandman and stuff, but Marvel Studios decided to go Molten Man for a, a Mysterio. I mean, Mysterio was not an A-list villain before Spider-Man Far From Home. You know what I mean? So you, I, I agree with you. Know, you can make the Batman movies really good, really popular without the really popular villain of the Joker. But I personally, if they're going to do it right, I'd love to see him come in somewhere in this trilogy because that will fill out this Batman universe, which is going to operate as solely a Batman universe. I don't think there's any way he doesn't come in in the trilogy. Yeah. I just don't yeah. want him in the first movie. And yeah, I oh, totally agree with you. Yeah, personally, yeah. I'd be okay with skipping the second two because honestly, I'm I'm overloaded on Joker from yeah. the comics and the shows and the movie. Like, I'm I'm good. I don't need another Joker for a minute. <laughs> so. Joker's even come out yet? Huh? Has three Jokers even come out yet? No, no, that's coming. No, not <laughs> somewhere, somewhere down the line, it's coming. Kofi, I think you're muted. Oh, I am muted. I've been sitting here talking to you. It's awesome. Uh, our old Joker all the time. All right, we're going to take a break and pay some bills. I also got to see who's at my door and why. So when we come back, we're going to deep dive into a bunch of fun geek stuff and talk about Evil Dead. So stay tuned for all of that. We're back. And now that we're in our deep dive, we're going to be talking about a lot of fun things. But first, we're going to talk about Netflix's new movie, which is based on a graphic novel. It's called... The Last Days of American Crime, and it stars Edgar Ramirez, who you might know from like, you know, a ton of stuff, and Michael Pitt, who you know from like Boardwalk Empire and Funny Games and, you know, some, a bunch of other stuff as well. So basically what this movie is, is about this kind of version of America where they develop this signal that stops people from committing crime. And this is kind of the high concept aspect of this, but it's really just a kind of hard boiled, gritty crime tale about a bunch of people who are trying to pull off this heist before, you know, heisting itself becomes impossible. And it's, oh man, it got, <laughs> this movie got a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oof. It got rated lower in both critical and fan scores as like lower than um, Avatar, the last, M. Night Shyamalan's The Last Airbender. So Brutal. that's what we're talking about. He, that's and a pretty, Kofi did not tell me this before he said, go watch I it. Didn't, I didn't know that before I started <laughs> watching it. It literally, that score came out literally today, like as we were watching it. Like, oh Charlie my God. That, that yeah, so I have not watched this. Painful. Somebody tell me, why is it so bad? Okay, so it's not bad. It's directed by Olivier Megaton, the guy who did Transporter 3, Columbiana with Zoe Saldana, Taken 2 and Taken 3. So you know what kind of like you're getting. It's this kind of crazy, you know, B-movie action stuff. Um, the Last Days of American Crime is, it's, it's just weird. It's kind of like this movie, I think he tried to like embrace the, it's the kind of same, the, it's the same kind of problem as the movie The Kitchen. Have you guys seen The Kitchen? Like uh, the one with... Uh, oh, I didn't. I never got around to it. But Yeah, I, Elizabeth I Moss and Tiffany Haddish and um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Melissa McCarthy. And it's based also based on a graphic novel that's about kind of Americana crime fiction. And just like that, Last Days of American Crime tries to kind of embrace the depth uh, and richness of a graphic novel in terms of like characters and world building and stuff like that but it's also just kind of really somber and dark because like Olivier Megaton is not one for subtlety or like you know depth and stuff so everything in this is just like everybody's horrible and like every scene to scene only like horrible things happen like it's just a bunch of criminals doing horrible stuff to each other torturing each other there's like two attempted rapes on the one female character. Oh, like everybody's just like a scumbag and violently killing and beating each other up. And like, it's just scene to scene kind of carnage and mayhem. And while trying to seem like more sophisticated and deeper than it is. And so it's just, 
kind of this weird and it's two hours and 28 minutes long which so I, long which i did not know i did and not know i could I not expected. figure out what was happening i literally could not figure out what it was about yeah it's, 30 it's, minutes into the program i still didn't know what was going on i had to stop it and go look it up like so i could understand why i care about any of these characters why like what is going on what is the only thing i understood was the government hand and like changing people's minds and that could have been so cool and i think that's the biggest disappointment is that the premise the idea is cool but i it it's so unclear and it has such unnecessary scenes dialogue like sh i i don't i just I, it makes zero sense and that's why for bizarre me, performances but like, i want to i want to i want to reword my question so now, now that I see why you don't like it, convince me to watch it. You should watch it just for Michael Pitt's <laughs> um, character. There's, Mike. there's boobs. There's yeah, lots there's, of boobs. There's nudity. <laughs> there's violence. Michael Pitt's character is like Michael Pitt's a great actor. Like I'll put that out there. If you saw, I literally can't Empire. think of any other reason. Um, <laughs> you, just for the boobs. Seriously, I, oh I, 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 it was so bad to me i mean i was like i had to turn on avatar last airbender because i was just like so pissed off by the end like i wasted so much time you guys and i never am negative like i like stuff <laughs> well, yeah i we hear you Kofi. <laughs> okay i was just making sure like yeah i mean michael pitt's a great actor and so he plays this very zany kind of spoiled brat crime boss kid and he's like the most lively thing in this but edgar ramirez is not like a charismatic leading man he usually plays the gruff kind of quiet dude and like so there's none of that the female lead is like really like supposed to be a femme fatale but she's also like highly vulnerable and upset and like none of the characters make sense like scene to scene this plan doesn't make sense like none of the details are clear there was like a scene in a bar when they first the kind of femme fatale and edgar ramirez meet and they just like bang each other in this bar and i thought this whole scene was playing out because they were like old an old flame that like knew each other and were just like playing this game in a bar where they're like seducing each other but then it turns out like no they don't know each other at all and like they had just met and i'm like yeah and it's like a crazy sexy in the bathroom and it's too like some guy richie lock stock and two spoken barrel song and it's just like yeah it's just cliched it's just a mess and it's two hours and 28 minutes long after an hour and a half i was like what is happening in this movie and i looked at the netflix and it was like you got an hour left bro and i was like wait what all right matt quarantine watch party me and you tonight no <laughs> yeah no don't no, waste your time i am not devoting two and a half hours to that I'm i'd rather watch the first harry potter call that yes. to a segment you won't ever see we yeah, should do a watch party harry potter that'd be great and it is just like lowest common denominator like how can we make each scene like just brutal and and uncomfortable from like the very opening scene where Edgar Ramirez's his character, the guy tied up in a bathtub and the torches him by dousing him in gasoline and lighting a cigar and just being like, if you have some time, maybe you'll survive. And like, that's the opening scene. And, and you're like, yeah, like I said, it's just, All right, yeah, then. It, it's a nuts. And, and there is no larger point to it. It's just like scene to scene to scene, criminals doing something to crime, you know, to, to, to keep crime and on and no larger point about violence or america or anything so yeah it's just a weird 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 movie to schlock through and and it's a pretty big miss for netflix like yeah so oh, no need to bother with that misses. what's that they've had their fair share of misses. oh yeah but this one's a big one because there's actual like there's actual money put into this like it's filmed and you can tell there's actual i mean there's a lot of explosions and ultra violent shootouts and big scenes and sequences. So yeah, I mean, yeah, so I don't know. Oh man, we reviewed that, but we totally skipped over a story that we kind of got to talk about. And uh, so we got to go backwards real quick. We found out that Evil Dead 4 is moving ahead and we even got a title from Bruce Campbell, which is Evil Dead Now. Um, yeah. And Unfortunately, Bruce Campbell's not going to be in it, but we don't need him to be. He just did Ash versus Evil Dead, if you want to watch that. Not a lot of you did. Go back and watch that. It's an excellent sequel series to the original Sam Raimi Evil Dead trilogy. Um, so you can go check that out if you want Bruce Campbell. But uh, we learned that this one is coming from uh, Lee Corcoran, I think his name is. And he's going to be, it's called Evil Dead now. And it's going to be another female heroine, uh, just like the Evil Dead. Oh, Lee Cronin. Uh, just like Fede Alvarez's 2013 Evil Dead uh, introduced kind of Jane Levy to the world. 
um, as the heroine in this. This will be another female heroine. And yeah, I think the thing that I'm most kind of curious about, and Bruce Campbell is praising the script, and Sam Raimi's a producer on this, and so he, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of legit. And I think the title is the most intriguing thing for me. Like, what is Evil Dead now? Like, and like, what kind of ideas does that mean? And, and I'm kind of curious to see what's next for the uh, franchise. Janelle, you were clapping. Is this, is this pleasing to you? I think it's really exciting. I love, you know me, more content. If I like something to begin with, I, uh, I hope for the best that they can bring it back in a great way. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm so starved for anything at this point. I, I, I'm watching The Sandlot, uh, Indiana Jones, Bill and Ted's Random. Excellent Adventures. I watched Monkey Trouble the other day, ladies and gentlemen. Wow, you gotta so, get yeah, I'm ready. I just, I just need more stuff. So give it to me, please. All right, most simple. <laughs> Anybody else? Evil Dead. I know Matt's a raging Evil Dead fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care. Not so, not so much, but I am always, in here's the thing though, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not the biggest Evil Dead aficionado, uh, but like Evil Dead movies take place in the present, right? They take place in like modern day America, they don't, they're not like, yeah, you know, yeah, period pieces, they, so, no, no, no. so like the title would imply that like, oh, it, it's a series is moving into the modern age, or it has to do with like technology now or like society now and to me that doesn't necessarily separate itself much from the other ones if the other ones are also kind of in that same vein in that same you know time period so i'm kind of curious as to why yeah the, i'm, I'm the kind of wondering if this because sam raimi's were all kind of irreverent horror story comedies i'm kind of wondering if this one could have more of a ramiro kind of pointed you know message or, or larger metaphor to it i don't know uh we'll see though you know it'll be coming up so evil dead says, evil dead now is expected to get filming this year so we could start to uh see more of that brandon davis says he doesn't care but when does it like... again you're gonna be like the first one at the junket talking through Bruce <laughs> <Curtis and stuff laughs> to That's true. i wonder if it's like a weird mashup of like evil dead and like the purge since like the purge kind of you know tried to do its own take on like modern day society and and like uh how crime is looked yeah like all that that would be an interesting mix but yeah well we'll see all right now bring us to a quick uh, we're just gonna do a quick stop into some geeky stuff and some wrestling stuff uh first up on the geek front we were just we said we were gonna start checking out avatar the last airbender i had never i've never really checked out the series um janelle had never really checked out the series and so we kind of gotten started on that and oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it 100 because uh, this is kind oh, of no. and I like oh, to. Oh no! Um, I'm about six or seven episodes into the series now, oh, and same. yeah, I, I mean I can see why people appreciate Avatar, and, and I appreciate it, but like it is a slow burn start for me, and I'm not instantly grabbed with oh my god, this is the greatest series on the face of the earth. But it is anime, even if it's an American Nickelodeon anime, and anime does is a slow burn art form of storytelling. So I can see where it could get a lot more exciting because there are have been some exciting highlights. Like a lot of the fights are really exciting. And there was like a, one episode about the uh, Earthbenders kind of getting released from their, from being enslaved by the Fire Nation. And that was really cool when they all staged this kind of uprising and you had you know, the, uh, the last airbender fighting with the earthbenders and the waterbenders and against the firebenders and stuff like that. And the battle sequences were pretty cool. There's been a couple dueling sequences that have been pretty cool. And so I can see like as this series evolves and, and the battles and the war and all that stuff becomes more prominent and it gets a little bit darker, like how it's going to be really exciting. But uh, yeah, it's definitely kind of, it's very much for kids. It very much looks like early 2000s kind of in in its design um it still holds up well in terms of animation but it is very much a kitty kind of silly start to it and so it's a little bit harder for to, to for me to kind of grab into but i'm gonna stick with it and that's same. just my opinion so don't come no me. i agree with you i'm completely I, i'm on the same page it does feel like a kid's show um which is a it's a departure from the movie that we watched <laughs> so the last days so putting the two next to each other uh but i i dig it it's just again not it's not like oh my gosh this is the best thing ever i i have been leaning more towards reading comic books uh than getting really into the anime currently 
but I'm trying to do everything. So, you know, like solid slow clap for that. But yeah, I think it's great. It's well done. It's cute. Um, that's, I mean, it's easy to be cool. It's harder to be super cool. I mean, it yeah. is. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Brandon, have you ever watched any anime? A uh, long time ago, I watched Dragon Ball Z. Gotcha. But I have not, I'm not up to date on recent anime. I hear Kofi and Megan talk about One Punch Man and My Hero Academia and all that stuff all the time. I just haven't gotten into it. Yeah. Like I said, it's hard to be super cool. Even harder to be elite <laughs> cool. But uh, no, I mean, it is a slow burn, but I want to I stick with it and see if there is a point that we come to that like I finally have the flip kind of switch. Flip the switch. Yeah. And then we just come back and we're like, oh my God, now I Did get you it. Get, so, yeah, yeah. So we're going to take a look at that and we'll keep at it. Moving right along, Matt. Connor isn't here, but uh, last show we had Connor Casey on because this weekend in wrestling was NXT TakeOver in your house. Say the whole thing I was instructed, so now I do. <laughs> we had a whole breakdown of what was going to happen. Uh, Matt, you were away taking a much-deserved break, so now you can come back and do some makeup work. Tell us what shook out at In Your House and uh, kind of what it says about you know the future of WWE. Yeah, uh, so uh, NXT TakeOver In Your House uh, was a basis. Of course, it's based on the classic uh, In Your House uh, pay-per-views that were from the 90s and it was cool to see like the aesthetic uh, they brought back like they had a set that looked just like the old set uh, there's a it reminded there me of a, like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air yeah very bad. much yeah. like uh, they played up like uh, DX uh, was they had like these little vignettes of like Shawn Michaels and and uh, like working on computers but, like they were old old computers and they were having a hard time and the with old technology. box tv yeah, yeah that was, was great, great. Uh, they really leaned into it uh, but mm -hmm. the actual you know matches and stuff like that it wasn't anything really super gimmicky uh, it was just right. a traditional takeover which takeovers are some of the best uh, wrestling pay-per-views around and I will say that because Jim's not here to poop poop crap <laughs> <laughs> so it's like there are some of the best ones around so uh, the big one of the biggest things was actually um, so WWE especially at Wrestlemania uh, we saw that cinematic matches have become a thing uh, especially with like the pandemic and not being able to travel and things like that so stuff is being pre-taped and filmed and we did have one of those here which uh, I don't know if BD noticed but uh, Velveteen Dream ended up donning some Negan gear uh, did a straight up had the bat. I saw that. Jacket. Yeah. Uh, Except so, he didn't have barbed wire on the He did bats. not have barbed wire. I did I notice like, that. Do you not know? But he the did have dead. like the reds. Like he had. He yeah, but the Walking lot. Dead in me, I was like, come on, that's like Lucille. <laughs> like you've got to get this right. You got to get the barbed wire. That is true. I did notice <sighs> that. Um, I literally like paused for a second because I was like, is he trying to do Negan? Because there is no barbed wire. I had that moment. Also, you Anyways, can totally sorry. tell, by the way, who the nerds are, and like, and I say that lovingly because I'm a giant nerd. You can tell who like the nerds are in wrestling because like Johnny Gargano popped up and he had Mando gear and like this crazy mix of Mandalorian armor. Isn't he always and, doing like crazy? Yeah. Uh... he's had Carnage and Wolverine and like yeah. So um, you know, and and like Ricochet wasn't on this, of course, because he's you know uh, I can't remember if he's Raw or SmackDown, but like he's always shown up in like the Nightwing gear, and uh, All Might was one of his gears at one point. Um, but as a cinematic match, it was a backlot brawl, and this was one where we honestly all fought because Adam Cole has had the title for three hundred and like sixty five days, that it was kind of time to pass the title on him, go do something, maybe go to another brand, and then Dream kind of get his time with the championship and that did not happen kind of shocked a lot of people and that led people to thinking well maybe dreams go into smackdown or raw and that doesn't seem to be the case either so the stipulation was that if he lost he couldn't challenge again for the championship as long as adam cole has it so that is a very interesting wrinkle uh and in fact there were a lot of those throughout the night uh some book some interesting booking things carrying cross and scarlet we talked a lot about on the site of how like their entrance is amazing and their recent additions and everyone kind of thought Cross is getting over on Tommaso Ciampa a lot in the actual weekly episode. So maybe that means that, uh, you know, he's going to lose at the pay-per-view. And again, that was not the case. And he came out looking Dude, like I a beat. I told you like years ago, I told all you guys, Karrion Cross, Scarlett Bordeaux coming up next superstars. Dude, they are, uh, they are, one, they're not going out of the park. But the fact that it was, it wasn't that they, like, Cross was the one, of course, in the match. But Scarlett was out there. But 
it wasn't like that they won. It was how decisively they won. Like Cross was made to look like an utter beast. And, you know, Ciampa's like one of the biggest names in NXT and one of the, you know, most like he's, he's a fan favorite for a reason. So the fact that it was so one-sided, it wasn't a, a squash, but it was really like they made Cross look like a threat, which is awesome. I think that's what they should have done. Uh, the other big turnout is that the triple threat match uh, between Charlotte Flair, Rhea Ripley, and Io Shirai, thank the Lord, gave us a new champion. So I don't have to see Charlotte on my screens twice a week. I get to just see her once a week on SmackDown, or maybe not. Maybe she'll just be on Raw. But it's been like three times a week for the last like two months. So I'm happy that the belt is hate now. Her, man. I like Charlotte. I just don't want to see her three times a week. <laughs> I have to cover two out of three of these shows, and I was seeing her every time. So – the fact is, it the belt is now on Io Shirai. She is the new NXT Women's Champion. We are gonna. She's fantastic. It's it's her time. Uh, Rhea Ripley will get her shot, I'm sure, down the line, and, and probably come back and get a championship run uh, after her brief one. But this just opens up a lot of the stuff. Also, Finn Balor set a record. My boy set a record for uh, 11 times. We've won the most takeover matches in NXT. I feel like, and there's a great article uh, written by someone. Uh, oh, that's right. It's me. Uh, written by me on the site that you can see of like feuds we want to <laughs> see coming out of this takeover. Uh, one of the ones I definitely want to see is Adam Cole and Finn Balor. Uh, also, Knox and uh, Tegan Knox and Candice LeRae is another great one that we should see. Uh, and then Keith Lee also and Karrion Cross. I would love to see that. Uh, so definitely check out the site. We got all the coverage on NXT TakeOver in your house. But that is a wrap on that. Yeah, and you've graduated right from that to uh, going right into gaming. We have a PS5 event date confirmed, and you have some comics to tell us about. Booyah! So uh, real quick on the gaming thing. Um, so the PS5 event, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the Microsoft... Brandon, Brandon, pay attention. <laughs> Microsoft did their <laughs> Xbox Series X event where uh, we saw a uh, yeah, we don't, bunch don't, of demos. We even have to mention those guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, only reason being is that this event is probably going to be the same type of thing. They're gonna, you're going to see a lot of sizzle reels and a lot of trailers of early, you know, done on engine type of things. It will vary depending on what is actually gameplay, what is not, cinematic stuff. Um, at the last, at the Xbox trailer, there was a lot of original IP. There was a lot of new stuff as opposed to like returning franchises. So I don't know how, you know, it would be interesting to see if Sony takes the opposite and maybe actually has some licensed stuff uh, in there or some bigger franchises, or if they just want to show off the tech and do a bunch of, uh, new IP, but uh, you can tune in on June 11th. I had been previously moved. Um, so June 11th, you can tune in. It's probably going to be about the same time frame, about an hour, and uh, see what the engine can do and what's coming up down the pipe. I think in, um, the thing, in the article, they did say that they're going to have like game footage and stuff broadcasting in 1080p. So if you have, like yes. they made note to say that it's going to look even better when you actually use the console on your 4K TV. Uh, so they're like really trying to push that. Like quality is going to be amazing. Make sure you're wearing headsets. You need a you're Sony have brand audio thing. 4K yeah. TV. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's no much. lie. I mean, I have a Sony TV and it does work better with a Sony product. It, it's insane. Please yeah, I'm ask a slightly maybe off topic, but still relevant, especially for you two PS4 pumpers. Uh, wow. The Last of Us 2, how, how is the reactions looking so far? Oh, man, we should probably get somebody in here to talk about that well, on the next show. Because so we, we do, because uh, I know what uh, Tanner is. Yeah, uh, Tanner's playing it. I was on the email thread where Tanner got the code, and it killed me inside. <laughs> killed me. Uh, but, so here's the thing, Brandon. Did you avoid the spoilers? I, have, I am spoiler-free. I muted okay. the words Joel, Ellie, and Last of Us on Twitter. And I've never okay. muted words before. I, because if we're, and, and I avoided the spoilers as well. Um, but what I will say is the reaction to the stuff that was out there wasn't as universally uh, positive as I would have assumed. I'm a giant Naughty Dog fan, so I mean, I'm Uncharted franchise for life, so it's not from any lack of that, and I love the first game. But I will say that once that stuff got out there, it did not get the universal like, oh, this is great. Now, I feel like part of that is just because anytime you don't have proper context for something and you see, 
something without, you know, uh, graphics, music, emotion, all that stuff that feeds into that, it's going to make an, an impact. So those same people might play the full game and go like, oh, well, this was actually pretty good. But just from the reading what was out there, I was surprised that it wasn't as it was as negative as it was. But we will see because I, I mean, I have faith in them. I, they're a great developer. So I think they'll, oh, they'll pull it out. Right. Um, so, yeah, so definitely tune in for that. It will be very interesting to see what Sony uh, does. Uh, moving into comics, we actually have a, a pretty full list this week. Um, but just going on, it's funny that we mentioned Joker before. So the Joker 80th anniversary 100 page Super Spectacular is the full name. Uh, is out and uh, it's a bunch of short stories um, from a variety of places. And one of the interesting things uh, also here, uh, we can get into spoilers. I don't actually know where Kofi sits on this. We can get into spoilers because DC Comics now release on Tuesdays. They don't release on Wednesdays anymore. So the book oh. is out. So we can oh, get into I'm wondering those. about why you're putting, like, is that what's happening? I've been yeah. meaning to yell at you all day about why do you keep putting these like DC Comics new stories in the thing? Yes. I'm like, where am I supposed to figure this out? Yes, so they are out now because oh. of the new distribution and the new schedule. DC Comics come out on Tuesdays, not Wednesdays. Wow. Everybody else is still on Wednesdays. So we can talk spoilers if you ever want to in the future. Here, I will just say for those who are following uh, Punchline, which is the newest uh, addition to the Batman mythos, uh, you will definitely want to read this because it does have what I guess you would consider an origin story uh, for her and, and how she uh, kind of comes, not comes in contact with the Joker, but like how things pick up. So definitely want to check that out, especially if you're reading Batman number 92, which is also out this week and, con and continues the march towards Joker War. And this is, uh, I will say because we can, this is not a story spoiler, but I will just say we get the Bat Train. And uh, it's a, a yet another uh, introduction of a bat gadget slash vehicle. Um, and he has his own train. I don't know why that, I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> it's just, I don't know why you would need a train if you have a, a ship and a plane and all this other stuff, but whatever. He has a train. Uh, we also have Faithless 2, number one, uh, Black Cat, number 11, uh, Dryad, number two, which is one of my personal favorites. First issue was really fun for uh, fantasy adventure fans. And this is definitely uh, one to check out. Also, The Return of Excellence which is one of the best comics in comics, just period. And, and it took a bit of a hiatus, uh, but now it's back. And this is one, like, if you, I just, I've gone, I've gushed about this book before. This is great. You should check it out. Uh, Go Go Power Rangers number 32 is the final issue in the series. So if you've been following it up to this point, this is the last one. Pour out a little liquor, but uh, I am excited to see what it kind of sets up. Also, Rick and Morty Go to Hell number one is out. Uh, Something is Killing the Children, number seven. And this is actually, this was out last week, but it is one I definitely wanted to mention. Uh, Far Sector, number six, uh, is also one of the best uh, comics out uh, in stores right now. Uh, it's also just a very, I mean, you know, we like to talk about things uh, that are kind of about the industry and about comics and things like that. But of course, we all know what's going on in the world right now. And this is a very uh, just excellent take on uh that societal conflict in the form of a comic book and when those two things merge and they do so eloquently this is what you get and so definitely uh check this out if you can so that is comics all right thanks matt That'll do it for this episode of Comic Book Nation. We want to thank you guys for tuning in as always during our quarantine lockdown arc. If you're just now getting into the show, we put up new episodes every Wednesday, every Friday on comicbook.com. You can also subscribe to our RSS feed and get regular updates of the show or subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platforms. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Google Playlists, iHeartRadio, and you can tell any Amazon Alexa device to fire up Comic Book Nation podcast and it'll start playing for you. If you want to watch the show, we air episodes Wednesday and Friday on Facebook Live. Or you can catch old episodes on uh, YouTube, on the uh, comicbook.com YouTube. We've seen a lot of you on the Facebook live feed. Keep shouting out. We love watching with you guys and seeing you. So, uh, yeah, drop a comment, drop a thumbs up or some kind of emoji and say what's up when we get those live viewings going. If you want to contact us individually, you can find me at Kofi Outlaw. You can find me at Janelle Wheeler and on Twitch. <laughs> you can find me at Matt Aguilar CB. You can find me in Nashville, Tennessee. 
Yo, you're giving up locations. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Don't, um, don't find me. Don't physically find me, please. That's bold. BD, you have anything? <laughs> you have anything you want to plug? You have any quarantine watch parties or anything coming up you want to plug? No, we've kind of held off on on those for now, just to let the current events news cycle have its spot that it deserves. Uh, I don't want to get in the way of anything like that. So. Yeah, I mean, there you go. That's a noble thing. So we'll keep you updated on what's going on because, uh, yeah, people who love quarantine watch parties that BD kicked off over here. And so we'll let you know what's going on with those. And, of course, when we one shining day get back into the studio, we are going to read so many iTunes five-star reviews. We might just have to do a whole show about it because we're going to give away T-shirts to everybody who held us down during this quarantine arc. And, uh, yeah, so go on iTunes, leave a five-star review because when we get back in the studio, we have a lot to give out. So be sure to do that, too. Thanks again for tuning in with us, guys. We'll see you guys next time on the next episode of Comic Book Nation. Stay safe. Stay tuned in. Take care of yourselves. And, uh, yeah, try to stay positive out here. All right, guys? Peace. Deuces.